Your skill set is a waste if you're not building something that can at least build a $10 million net worth. What you have to offer is way greater than that. So let's talk about it. I don't think people realize how much the game of entrepreneurship has expanded over the last 10 to 15 years. And I was asked to give a keynote to show a group of entrepreneurs how much opportunity had been created and how much was coming over the next few years. And in this talk, I give the playbook for how to take advantage of these opportunities because this is the first time in history that you could literally start with nothing and have an eight-figure exit, make tens of millions of dollars in just a handful of years. That used to be impossible. That used to be insanity. That used to be absurd, but it's possible now. And I give the playbook throughout this presentation. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to be on a stage like this because I got into this world just because I thought I was gonna be a pastor for most of my young adult life. And pastors made like $30,000 a year. And I wanted to scratch my entrepreneurial itch, my entrepreneurial tendencies. Spoiler alert, I'm no longer a practicing Christian. If I say fuck, it's okay. Gonna... So I got into this game because I had this entrepreneurial itch. And I also felt this, like this, this guilt between this tension of being a wannabe pastor and also wanting to be a wannabe very, very rich man. And I had this, it's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle. That's actually a fascinating passage, by the way, when you take it apart, but that's, that's a sermon for another day. I had this professor in college who gave this presentation who basically argued that free market capitalism, that making a lot of money, that creating products in the marketplace was the most ethical and contributive thing that you could do for society. And I had what we call a brain gasm. He actually said, half of you are wondering, what does God want you to do with your life? And that's why he gave you the marketplace. The marketplace will tell you where you provide value in the world. And I couldn't unsee that lesson. I wanted to be here yesterday, but I was in New York. I try to have dinner with Gary Vee about once a year. That's my humble brag social proof picture right there. And the reason why I'm fascinated with Gary and the thing that came up a lot in our conversation this week was the fact that Gary actually doesn't care about the result. He just cares about creating and building. He actually said, at, I asked him, I said, what allows you to stay in that place all the time? And he said, well, most people, as they're building companies, are optimizing for the exit or the distributions. I want neither. I just want to build the biggest building. And that stuck with me because I've seen and felt what it's like to operate in a place of abundance, kind of. Like, I get it intellectually. We all like to talk about abundance. We like to pontificate about it. We have platitudes about it. But it's always a beautiful reflection when you're around somebody who actually lives it. And the truth is that most of us as entrepreneurs, especially in the marketing world, like to talk about abundance, but we act like it's scarce. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I'm going to start with asking you a question. Is there anyone old enough, and be honest, it's okay, we won't judge you. Is there anyone old enough that actually doesn't, wasn't alive, but actually remembers the year 2008? Give it up for these pioneers in the room. If, if you weren't there, it was chaos. Cars, you had to drive them yourself. They ran on gas, they exploded. There was a woman running for president and that was a big deal. I mean, it was absolute madness. There was no Facebook ads. There was no Amazon FBA. There was no like button on Facebook. Right. You had to earn your dopamine back then. 
There was no Shopify. There were no social media influencers. Guys, there was no Bitcoin. You had to transact in US dollars. And you had to take their word for what the dollar was worth. <laughs> Guys, it was so nuts. We didn't even have chat GPT. We had to write essays ourselves. The, the world was absolute madness in 2008. This is really when internet marketing, as it's known today, was born. Back then, we actually called it internet marketing instead of today, which we just call it marketing. Something really interesting happened in 2015, is when Amazon bought Whole Foods. This was when, the first time, an internet business bought a real business. A business that started as an internet business gobbled up a legacy grocer. This was a big deal. It was a sign that the internet had won. It had matured. But 2008 is really when the modern internet marketing world was born. Now, up until that point, internet marketing, if you're old enough to remember, was something that you did on the side. I got started from a college dorm room studying to be a pastor. And one day I logged into my ClickBank account and there was $100 in there. And I never looked back. That was internet marketing in 2006, 7, 8. It was something you did on the side. The dream was to make $10,000 per month in your underwear working four hours a week. That was the dream. Every sales letter had it on it. It was what we lived for. There was no concept of this idea that you could build a company and a few years later have a net worth of $100 million. That was, that was Dr. Evil level, $100 billion. It did not exist. People were optimizing for lifestyle. That was the dream. Then this year called 2008 came along. You had this mass of people who all of a sudden realized that the old dream wasn't what they wanted. You had this massive change in the economy. You had this massive, cha massive change in expectations. This is when old school business people had a wake up call and they started looking at what the next industry was gonna be and it was already starting to be built by this wide open west period of crazy entrepreneurs who wanted to make $10,000 a month in their underwear working four hours a week. A lot has happened since then. First of all, we realize that $10,000 a month isn't all that much money. We realize if you only work four hours a week, it's kind of freaking boring and working in your underwear actually isn't cool. I hope I didn't just ruin any of your dreams. <laughs> What am, I, what am I working toward? Why am I here? If I can't work in my underwear, what have I been doing this for? But, but this community was really brought out of this time of massive chaos in 2008 where people started recalibrating their dream. But because I come from this world, I, I kind of have this idea, this thesis, that because so many of our peers had their wake-up call and got started during this time, right before there was Facebook ads, right before there was social media, right before there was this big boom. They got started in a time of chaos. There is this sense and this feeling in this community like there's always another shoe that's about to drop. There's always this sense that is all about to be pulled out from under us, like the rug is about to be pulled. And in fact, I was on this stage one year ago, and these were the conversations that I was having when I got off stage. These are real conversations that I had at this event last year. People were, people were freaking out about there going to be a recession in 2023. It was all the conversation. Everybody thinks, we all know there's gonna be a recession in 2023, right? All the hands go up. I remember being outside on the terrace and someone saying, I think 2023 is gonna be the worst year in human history because I read the book Pendulum written by Michael Drew and they said that the zenith of we is gonna be 2023 and the whole world's gonna fall apart. And there's a conversation I had here. People saying, you know there's gonna be hyperinflation, right? 
I saw it in an Agora sales letter. The sales letter was written in 2020, 2002, updated for 2004, updated for 2006. They change out who the Speaker of the House is. Same exact message. And there were people who were like, well, you know, I'm pretty sure Bill Gates is going to release another pandemic before the midterms. This, is, this was the conversation that we are having a year ago. We made it. Guys, we made it through 2023, like we did it. We made it through the worst year of human history. And this comes up a lot. I mean, every year there is a question about like, when's, like, when's the rug gonna be pulled? Is it, has anybody experienced that specifically in the entrepreneurial world? Yes, four of you are honest and the rest of you are the ones who are afraid. I got it. Now, I like, I like to kind of jab the ribs of the people who peddle this type of fear porn. But I actually have a lot of empathy for this because abundance is actually a very new concept. Capitalism is 200 years old as an idea. Abundance, the idea, I, our, my, my grandparents' grandparents lived through the Civil War. America is 250 years old. Abundance is a new idea. We have not calibrated to the fact of we do not have to hunt our food anymore. This is new to our brains and our bodies. Like we talk about it a lot in like the paleo diet. Our bodies are still wired to be eating whatever olive oil and cheese is paleo. But from the idea of economic security, that idea is like 60 years old. The idea of you actually having the ability to create something and it generate wealth, this idea did not exist for our grandparents. It's a new idea. So we're still recalibrating to this idea of what it actually means to have abundance. So as a result, we still see ourselves as separate. We still see ourselves as not making the pie, but getting a slice of the pie. There's still this idea in culture of if you win, you did it on the backs of somebody else. That idea is still prominent in society. It's a myth, it's an illusion, and we can talk about it all day long, but the fact of the matter is our brains haven't caught up to this idea that we don't have to struggle in order to create abundance. We don't, we don't have to work for 50 years doing things we hate. That is not use, where our bodies have not begun to understand that. And we forget this idea that what you are doing is actually contributing to the overall growth of everyone around you. It is not just for you because abundance is a new concept. So entrepreneurs, especially internet marketers, I would submit to you, we tend to play small because we got into this game during a time of scarcity and usually from a place of scarcity at a time in history in which abundance is still a new concept. And so we have not yet seen enough examples of the fact that you don't have to create a business just to get your slice. You can pursue creating something that is just amazing and you'll get way richer as a result. That's a new idea, but it's time. And something I discovered, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never told this story before. Um, I remember being at an event, this, this must have been like 2010. I remember being at an event, and this was an event, this is like during, this is actually when ClickBank kicked me and all the other internet marketers off because most people just had all these sleazy skit sales letters about like software you can install and make $3,000 a day or whatever. And, I remember being at this event and there's this guy, I don't remember his name, he's not around in our space anymore, but he was just talking about how he and his friends would put up sales letters and they'd all mail for each other. And I said, so basically you have a big circle jerk. And he laughed and he was like, yeah. <laughs> and I, I walked out of there so upset because I was, I was, thought I was gonna be a pastor, was just like deconverting from my faith and was trying to learn exactly how the people that I thought were super successful were doing it. And then I just saw that they were 
trying to take as much as they could. And I walked out of there angry and probably half drunk because I had had half a Bud Light Lime or something. And I walked out of there and I remember just saying, I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I have to out-convert them. I don't care if I have to outwork them, but I'm going to beat them being one of the good guys. And what I discovered is that if you take an ounce of the skill set of what we know as marketers and you apply it to a real business that actually creates meaningful value for a specific group of people, it works better. You end up making way more money. So the minute that you can have the shift of just creating something amazing, instead of saying, what is the short-term result that I can get out of this, a weird thing happens. Call it God, call it the universe, call it consciousness, call it karma, whatever. You end up making way more. And you have a skill set that is such a waste if it is just used for short-term profit. And I also know what that costs in terms of a feeling. Like, I, 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 know, I know how shitty that feels. And I also know how exciting it is when you apply it to something that you're actually proud of. The megaphone gets louder and you grow faster than you ever could just doing it for the short-term profit. And so I would invite to you that it's time. Like I would invite to you to consider that maybe it's time for you to set your sights a little bit bigger, not because of the dick measuring contest that so often happens in this room, not just because it is egoic to say, I'm gonna build a hundred million dollar thing, but because your skill set is a waste if you're not building something that can at least build a $10 million net worth. At least. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your skill set. You're too powerful. What you have to offer is way greater than that. So let's talk about it. And I think if you really understood how much abundance there is and is being created, you would have no need to play scared. You would have no need to worry about the short-term profit. Like if you really understood you really embodied this. So let's have a little bit of a preview. Capitalism is about 200 years old. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations and he died in 1790. He did not see the impact of his work. Back then, they did not have Google. They did not have ChatGPT. Information spread a little bit less quickly. The idea of capitalism did not really take foothold until the 1800s. Since that time, 83% of extreme poverty eradicated in 200 years, 83%. And this graph only goes to 2015. 83% of extreme poverty, gone. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years of extreme poverty. Then capitalism comes along, 83% of it is gone in a few generations. It's still a new idea. And we're spoiled because we live in the United States of America. Most of the world does not actually have free markets. And our free markets are not perfect. They are far from perfect. But most of the world has none. It's still a new idea. It's still emerging. This is a graph that shows the CO2 emissions in the United States from 1975 to 2023. We have now reduced carbon emissions back to their 1980 levels. A little bump up because we had a little overcorrection during COVID. But we've now reduced carbon dioxide emissions back to their pre-1990 levels. And the trend is accelerating. Capitalism did that. Now, the thing that I like to talk about, remind people when we have debates about capitalism, is Capitalism is the process of solving higher and higher quality problems. There will always be problems, and you're always born into your group of problems, and you always see the problems of your generation, but the generation that you're in is solving much higher quality problems than the one before. The ones that we're solving are like, hey, we probably burnt too much of this oil stuff. We probably want to get a hold on that. A couple generations ago, it was, hey, mom froze to death last night because we don't have abundance of energy. Now we're like, I'm going to turn on the heat. Global warming. Bigger problem to solve. And along came this nice little man named Elon Musk, and he's leading the charge. Capitalism did that. 
You should be proud of them. You should be proud to be one of them. And you should be afraid of wasting that talent on something that is so short-term focused when we're the ones creating the pie. Capitalism, capitalism is accelerating. This is a graph that shows the number of millionaires just in the last 15 years. It's accelerating. It's going up. Inflation. The Fed is printing it. Saw the sales letter saying it's going to, the dollar is going to, not. I get it. Yes. My background's in Austrian economics. We're like the black sheep of economics. We're like the most conservative ones. I get the arguments about inflation and Fed printing, but a capitalism is accelerating. I, I hope I don't offend any of you by saying this, but capitalism is stronger than Joe Biden. Freedom and free markets, they continue to grow. They continue to expand. There is no president who can hold it back. There is no policy that can stop it. Freedom's out of the bag. Capitalism is, capitalism is winning. And it's winning at a faster and a faster rate. In fact, let's just look at the last 15 years. We talked about with 2008, how it was chaos. Now, we've gone from no Facebook ads to $144 billion a year spent. No Amazon FBA, there are now more Amazon sellers than there are Amazon employees. There was no TikTok, now it's the fastest growing social media network in history. There was no Instagram, you checked it twice since I stepped on this stage. <laughs> there were no social media influencers, now they're an essential part of business. There was no ChatGPT and now AI is gonna kill us all. <laughs> now there's this thing, it's not even a company. Like, no one runs it. This thing called Bitcoin, it's worth a trillion dollars. Fastest entity ever to hit a trillion dollars. This is the last 15 years. And we worry about there being a recession. This is the last 15 years. Capitalism is growing. It's expanding. We're going through the greatest era of expansion ever. And we're going to witness the next one too. Let's get ready for it. Now, one more question. Is there anybody else here old enough to remember, be honest, when a trillion dollars was a lot of money? I remember this too. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember telling my dad that I wanted to make all the money in the world. That is a real picture of me, Christmas morning, seven years old. He's so hot, he's so hot. Look at that hair. I still dress like this on most days. I have not learned yet. I said, dad, I wanna make all the money in the world. And my dad said, do you know how much money that is? It's a trillion dollars. You laugh, but I looked it up. He was actually right. In, nine, in, about nine, in the early 1990s, the total money in circulation was $1 trillion. Now, that's not the total amount of wealth. That was the amount of money in circulation. Back then, we, we, um, we used uh, actually paper and coins to buy things. And the amount, you went to the bank and you put it, it was, watch a movie, it was wild. So, <laughs> So there was a trillion dollars in circulation at the time. That was all the money in the world. So something happened to my brain in 2018 when Apple crossed a trillion dollars in market cap because I went, oh, that's all the money in the world. But I didn't really get it then. It was two years later in 2020 when they passed $2 trillion. When I realized, oh my goodness, Tim Cook just created all the money in the world in two years. And two years later, they were worth $3 trillion. And in four years, we've created twice the amount that I thought was all the money in the world 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Capitalism is accelerating. It's expanding. Now, this right here is the total amount of wealth in the world. That's different than the amount of, total than the amount of um, money in circulation. This is slightly out of date. It's almost $500 trillion now. In our lifetime, meaning like the next few years, total wealth in the world will hit for the first time one quadrillion dollars. That's a thousand trillions. Now the question comes up, oh, and by the way, my favorite part of this graph, if you look at the bottom, India, Latin America, and Africa, you think they're going to stay at the bottom for long? No, most of them don't have internet. 
A third of the world doesn't have internet. A third of the world. Three billion people still don't have internet. So do you realize that you're on the cusp of a great era of expansion? A huge era of expansion. Now the question comes up, where did all the money come from? What the fret, what, what's the Fed printing? It comes from the creation of new assets. This is what people don't realize. Money is created when assets are created. Asset classes are created all of the time. Businesses are created all of the time. There is not a fixed amount of wealth in the world. Every time you create an asset that has real value, you expand the amount of money that exists in the world. The creation of new assets increases the amount of money and abundance that exists in the world. And you as an entrepreneur have a thing called a company that is an asset and it's the greatest asset that you have. And so that you have a moral obligation to make it worth as much money as possible. It is your gift to the next generation. It is the legacy that you are leaving. You are not separate from the whole. You are not separate from all that is. You are creating it and expanding it. And so you have an obligation. It is your moral gift to God and the universe to make your company as valuable as possible. So if Apple can be worth $2 trillion, make $2 trillion in four years, if global wealth will exceed a quadrillion dollars in our lifetime, is it really such a big deal to think about making $100 million in your lifetime? I mean, we talk so much about the trends, catching the next trend, catching the next wave of the product, catching the next crypto bull run. You're in the biggest bull run of them all. It's called capitalism. And we're expanding faster than ever. And we're right at the beginning of the first S curve because we're only 200 years old. And 15 years ago was when the real entrepreneurial expansion began. And we get to ride this wave for decades from now, so you might as well play for something that is meaningful. Let's talk about how to do that. There's three types of money. The first is cash flow. Most of you know what that is. There will not be a presentation today about what cash flow is. If you don't know what that is, you are in the wrong room. Wealth is the second one. Wealth is the total amount of value and net worth built up from your long-term investments. If you were to sell it all, this is the amount of money it would be worth. And the third is enterprise value. That's the value of your business entity. Most entrepreneurs stop at number one. They only optimize for cash flow because the dream was to make $10,000 a month working four hours a week working in your underwear. So they stop the conversation at cash flow. But the faster that you can reverse the order, the wealthier you will become. So the order should be first, you build a business with enterprise value. Then you can take either the profits or the cash flow or borrow against it, or you can sell it and you can invest it for wealth and passive income. And then you never have to worry about cash flow ever again. But most entrepreneurs do it backwards. They're thinking about short-term cash flow so that they can feel safe in the short term and then they never feel abundant in the long term. So we reverse the order. We focus on enterprise value, then focus on wealth, then we worry about cash flow. And all of you are in such a beautiful position because you know how to sell shit. You don't need to take a bunch of distributions from the thing that you're building long term that's gonna be worth millions of dollars. You can actually roll that into the next era and just keep compounding enterprise value and you get to be richer than everybody else the longer that you can put that off. So since most entrepreneurs for cash flow, it's, they're like starving the baby. But if you know that you are building something on the biggest wave up ever, then you keep building it, keep compounding it. The more you can focus on enterprise value, the faster and the richer, the richer you will become and the faster you will become rich. Now let's talk just briefly about where we are in the stage. I was on this stage last year while everybody was freaking out about there being a recession and I said, we're gonna have an asset price recession, not a productivity recession. We're gonna have asset prices come down, but productivity is gonna be about the, about the same. That has held. I also said, Facebook was trading at $90. I said, by the way, Facebook's really cheap right now. 
It's now trading at over $300 a year later. Here's where we are on the stage now. There's going to be a recession. <gasps> it's going to be mild, but it's going to be extended, right? We're just going to have a bump in the road where there's not going to be a big boom for a long time because we're trying to, we've actually done a pretty good job at staving that off. So it's going to be short, meaning it's going to be small, but it's going to be a bit extended. This is the time to pounce. This is the break. This is the opening. And we've got about a year and a half to two years. We're in year one of about a three year asset price recession where things are going to come down. Now, what happens politically? Don't know. I stopped betting on that about eight years ago. That's a wild card. Deflation, that's a wild card. But if things stay like they are, as Jim Rohn used to say, they'll be about the same. <laughs> hey, I like four of you in the room who got that reference. Yeah, we're going to hang out later. We're in year one about this three-year bump where it's time. It's time to pounce. This is the reset. It's the great reset. This is the big reset before the next boom. This is the time to plant seeds. Now is a really good time to plant for that. Now, during this time, some of the most underpriced things are audiences and advertising, where there's consolidated attention with other people's email lists, influencers, buying media. It's really, really underpriced right now. And market share is up for grabs. So now is the perfect window to cast a vision that is big enough to enroll other people into. And then the next era looks a lot like the next boom of AI, blockchain. My screen just went down, so I'm gonna look over here awkwardly. <laughs> and other areas of expansion like asteroid mining. Space mining could actually become a real thing. And here's how much abundance there exists right now. This is my favorite part. That some asteroid mining might have enough resources to give everyone on Earth $100 billion, which is the exact amount of money that Dr. Evil pointed his finger at his bottom lip about. <laughs> Release the meteor, $100 billion. It's playing out perfectly. I don't think Austin Powers was a comedy. It was a documentary. <laughs> so now is a really good time to start planting seeds. Not just seeds for a lot of wealth, but seeds for the thing that you actually want to do. Because so many of us got into this game because we wanted to make enough money to do the thing that we wanted to do, and then we never figured out what the fuck we actually wanted to do. We just kept building businesses for the short-term cash flow. It's a really good opportunity right now to be able to cast a different vision. Because we're about to go into an era of so much abundance and so much expansion that we now have the opportunity to build something that actually contributes to the rest of the world and reflects what we want to be in this world, and we get paid even more as a result of doing it. Hey, if asteroids are going to give us all $100 billion, we might as well have fun doing it, right? We might have fun along the way until the asteroids get mined. So this is my model for how we do it. So I've helped approximately, I stopped counting at about 500. 500 people build seven-figure businesses. Some of them have gone on to have eight-figure exits. Some of them had nine-figure exits. And this is the model that we put them all through. We have three areas that we intersect. Those three areas are product, audience, and sales channels. In the marketing world, most people are just good at one of these, and it's called sales channel. And so you know how to sell things. I work with a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs. So they know about how to do all the tips and tricks on Amazon. And I tell them they'll make a great Amazon sales channel manager for whoever, for whoever hires them. It's just one leg of the stool. It's not really valuable until you marry it with the other two parts of the diagram, which are audience and product. Audience, if you only focus on that, you're an influencer and you're broke. If you are a Optimizing for sales channels, you're a copywriter and there's 
three people who do really well when they get equity in a company and the rest are scrounging for their next client. Or you're an Amazon sales channel manager and you'll be hired by the next capitalist. If all you do is product, then you are shining up your golden turd for the next 10 years, making it perfect and no one buys. So we have to bring all three of these together, product, audience, and sales channels. This is how you build a company that you can sell. This is how you build a company that has real enterprise value. Now the trick for this is that what I aim to do is to create partnerships in each of these three areas. So I'm simply the owner. So if you have a partner with an audience, a partner with product and a partner or an employee who is managing the sales channel, you get to be the owner, which allows you to cast a vision for a company that is actually worth something. You don't do this because you're trying to do all three of these mostly focused on sales channel or mostly focused on audience. But you don't build anything that you can really sell until you bring the three pieces together. So the minimum viable business that you can sell looks like the following. In product, you have a handful of products, my magic formula. I wrote a book called 12 Months to 1 Million, sold 300,000 copies, and I wrote the book because I never wanted to say four products times 25 sales a day times $30 is a million dollar business ever again, and it backfired. But your minimum viable business that you can sell is a handful of products. Four times 25 is 100 sales a day. At $30, it's $3,000 a day, $90,000 a month. You have a million dollar plus business. It's your minimum viable business. If you know anything about marketing, you're taking a fire uh, flamethrower to a knife fight and you just crush everybody out there, especially when you don't need to take short term profit off the table and you can just focus on acquisition. You can get to hundred sales a day very quickly. It's your minimum viable product, meaning like product structure. Audience, you need one platform of a specific person that you help that you're genuinely interested in serving. Not that you think will convert, but that you're genuinely interested in making a difference in their life. It can be email list, it can be Instagram, it can be blogs, influencers, I don't care, but you need one audience source. And then your sales channel, you marry it with one sales channel, whether that be ClickBank or Shopify. TikTok shop, very interesting right now. Very interesting. That, that might be on the slide next year when I'm like, there was no TikTok shop. <laughs> so we need one from each of these. We need the product suite, we need audience, we need sales channels, we bring them together. The goal is to create partnerships with all three of them so that you are the owner and you get to just cast the vision, bring in the people, and focusing on having the impact that you want. This is the structure that we use to be able to do that. Now, let me give you an example of one that we're doing within our portfolio right now. So we have a low sugar, high protein snack brand called Sinless Snacks. Don't look it up. We're doing a rebrand right now. It looks old. Don't judge me. Don't Google it. And definitely don't buy every product in the suite. No. Uh, so there's a low sugar, high protein brand. They have a Rice Krispie treat that is freaking delicious. You can't tell the difference between a Rice Krispie treat and this one that is 90 calories and 10 grams of protein. They're, small, they're a small brand. They do about $500,000 a year in top line revenue. We can value the company at about $2 million. We go raise capital from private investors. If I put together a really good pitch deck, I could raise more, but just standard, we could probably raise at about a $2 million valuation based on the team and the growth trend and the product line and all of this. Well, in the last year, we brought on an influencer He's one of uh, uh, the two remaining relevant keto influencers in the world. There's Thomas DeLauer and him. And um, he actually has an audience that's growing in the keto space and he still, has, he still has a lot of influence there. We brought him on and we gave him $100,000 worth of shares. $100,000 worth of shares in the company, invested over time. We can talk later about how we structure that. But we brought this person on to have $100,000 worth of shares, which is basically the same amount that he would take home from having a sponsorship. We just did it in shares instead of doing it with money. Now, as a result of putting this person on the pitch deck, we can now raise capital at at least a $3 million valuation. How much did the influencer cost? 
You guys are smarter than I thought. Nothing. In fact, he made us $900,000 by putting them on the deck. Why? We were focusing on enterprise value, not cash flow. So we brought in the influencer. There was an immediate raise of a million dollars. We could, have, we could raise more, but immediately the value of the company raises by a million dollars. And now his shares are actually worth $150,000. Immediately. We give him $100,000 in today's value of shares. The minute the deal is signed, the value of his shares go up 50%. The investors, how many of you are a little bit happier as an investor in this company that there is now a distribution channel of people who are literally hungry for these snacks? Yeah, you're more confident in this deal now. Everyone is happier. The founder's happy, the investors are happy, the influencer's happy, more customers see the product, we're good. This is a good deal, right? We do this with all three of those areas, audience, product, and sales channel. When you focus on building enterprise value, you start thinking like a real capitalist. You start thinking about how we create the biggest pie possible, not how I get the distributions from the small pie that I created working four hours a week in my underwear. So now, if we raise at a $300 million valuation, we sell 10% of the company, we have now $300,000 of working capital that we can use for R&D on new products, hire the best sales channel, channel manager in the world, and now the value of the company goes up, and so do our sales. This is the game. This is how we structure it. This is how we play to win. It's, it's my, my true belief that we're the last generation that will understand the idea of what financial scarcity is. I, I, I genuinely believe that our generation, like our mission, is that we are ushering in the era of abundance. We're the last generation, maybe my kids' generation, will remember what financial scarcity was. Now, we'll have a whole host of other problems when there's infinite abundance. Like, we'll have all, all kinds of new problems for us to solve. But this window, like these 50 to 100 years, is my genuinely, genuine belief that we're the last era of financial scarcity. As an entrepreneur, that's a pretty cool mission to be on. If you believe that you know, consciousness is expanding or whatever it is that you believe, that you're here, you're here for a reason, then the reason you're put on this earth as an entrepreneur is because you're part of the process that is ushering in the era of abundance. The time in history when there was a movement away from financial scarcity into abundance. And your success as an entrepreneur is a contribution into that next generation. So when you create a business that is in genuine service to another person, you're literally expanding the pie for everyone. Cancer research can't fund itself. Kids can't buy themselves out of being trafficked. Only capitalism can do that. And by the way, this is totally off script. The best example of this in the world, in history, is that capitalism ended slavery. Slavery existed for thousands and thousands of years. And then in the 1800s, there was a new idea, a new idea that you as a person have sovereign rights. The idea that when you work, you get to keep the fruits of your labor and that you as an individual have rights and that you're contributing to the rest of us. And then we declared independence in 1776. And one year later, one year later, an independent region the first one on earth, called Vermont, said, we don't want any of that slavery shit here. This is a new era. First region on earth, only region on earth. Within 15 years, five more regions in the United States abolished slavery, and within 100 years, it was gone. 10,000 years of slavery, capitalism got rid of it in 100 years. Capitalism did that. The same is true with cancer research, with kids being trafficked. They can't save themselves. Only capitalism can do that. And you, bigging, you making the biggest pie possible is your contribution 
into that next era of abundance. Thank you for having me. I'm Ryan Moran. Facebook ads, TikTok, influencer marketing, Amazon FBA, these opportunities did not exist 10 to 15 years ago. And over the next 10 to 15 years, there are gonna be just as many new innovations that make it possible for entrepreneurs to create businesses that make the world a better place. I like to be a part of that trend. There's so much inherent negativity that exists in the world, especially if you're watching content on the internet. Everyone has an opinion about how the world is going and how things could be better, but entrepreneurs are the ones who are actually making things better. And that's why I invest in entrepreneurs and help them build seven-figure businesses that make their families better, make their communities better, and make the world better. And if you want some help, you can find our free resources in the description of this video or go over to capitalism.com slash playbook to see how we take businesses from nothing to a million dollar business in about a 12 month time frame. I'm Ryan Daniel Moran with capitalism.com. Thanks for watching. See you next time.